to all protocols. And thank you, everyone here who's kept time to be here with us. Remember, we are streaming this event, so please be aware of that even as we continue. Allow me at this moment to invite a representative from the University of Nairobi, our host for today. You give him a big round of applause as he comes forward to welcome us before we move to the next part of the program. Mumsindikiza na makofi, musimuati atende. Bila iyo tafadhali. Asante. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Wahiga uh, Mwaira. It's good to be here again. Um, Tim Davy, uh, the Director General of BBC, and your big team here in Nairobi today, uh, university faculty present here, uh, students uh, from University of Nairobi, and students from other universities. Uh, good afternoon. Please feel welcome to the University of Nairobi for this very exciting lecture. My role is very simple. I'm here on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, who the guest has had the opportunity to meet earlier, just to welcome him and also to introduce him uh, to come on stage and uh, engage with you. Today is your day. He's going to have uh, a very good engagement, and we expect a lot of uh, questions and uh, comments. And uh, we look forward to a very exciting moment uh, with the Director General uh, from BBC. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I welcome all of you to the University of Nairobi. Indeed, it's a pleasure for the University of Nairobi to host BBC uh, team for another time. We've been hosting BBC teams, uh, producing different programs here uh, over the years. And we are partnered with the BBC and work with them in various programs uh, and initiatives. Uh, some of them, like just to mention, the World Book Cafe, a recording of Professor Wangugi Wadiongo, uh, was done here in our library. The BBC Masterclass by Martin Smith. And then also the beautiful uh, uh, mural at the Education Building uh, by the Agile Artist that was uh, uh, brought here by the BBC. We also have the BBC Health, BBC Health Program, which was recorded here in, partner, in partnership with our uh, Department of Journalism. And of course, also the, the very popular uh, BBC Global Quiz. Uh, we've done it here with your teams a number of times. Uh, it's always uh, very nice to have you and you have your teams here uh, streaming the Global Quiz from the University of Nairobi. Our relationship with the BBC reinforces our business, uh, our business of generating uh, knowledge generation and knowledge dissemination. Uh, we are pleased to engage and work with uh, industry partners like BBC uh, so that we are able to impart the industry skills and share perspective with our students and faculty on uh, trends uh, where the world is going and also to enable our students to understand the global picture Things are changing so fast, and uh, we need people with different experiences to share with them so that they are able to challenge their own perspectives and also be able to adapt to the skills that are required today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today is not my day. Uh, it's a day for the Director General, and allow me now to introduce our guest for today, uh, Director General Tim Davy. Davy became the Director General of the BBC on 1st September 2020. He's the 17th Director General of the corporation. Prior to this, he was the Chief Executive of the BBC studio, the BBC principal commercial subsidiary. He's respons he was responsible for creating and distributing leading British content globally. Team led BBC studios from uh, April 2013. Whilst in the role, he oversaw the merger between the BBC production uh, production arm and BBC Worldwide, the corporation distribution company, and was responsible for the annual turnover of over 1.4 sterling pound billion. Can you give him a clap? <laughs> That's a... <laughs> During this time at the BBC, he has previously held the role also of the director of audio uh, and music, with the overall responsibility for the BBC's national radio output, its digital services, and performing groups and the Director of Marketing also, Director of Marketing and Communication and ODS Division. He was also acting BBC Director General between November 2012 and April 2013. Before joining the BBC, 
he was the vice president of marketing and franchise of Pepsi Europe. And before that, Tim worked for the Procter and Gamble after leaving Cambridge University, where he read English. Uh, he's saying he's an English student. Okay. <laughs> Tim is a trustee of the TED and member of the European Broadcasting Union Executive Board. He's also a former chair of the Comic Relief and former co-chair of the Creative Industries Council. Tim was awarded a commander of the British Empire, CBE. Can you clap for him? Uh, and that was in 2018 for service to international trade. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, the Director General, uh, our Chief Guest, uh, Team Devi, to come on stage and uh, engage with you today. Please, a round of applause and rise up. Marco Fita Fadali, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause and please be upstanding as the Director General of the BBC now joins us on stage. You may take your seat, sir. And even as the Director General gets comfortable, there's a clip I'd like us to play at this moment. I'll also allow the technical team to move the podium. Now, the BBC draws upon its vast networks. Yes, you may take your seats of journalists to deliver some of the best stories that you've seen across the African continent and even from the diaspora. Before we engage with the Director General, we'd like you to see a snippet of that work. Technical team, you may play that clip. A new service with a massive weekly audience. With global coverage from regional bureau. Telling more stories than any other provider. This is the BBC World Service. In an instant. We reach into people's lives. Clarifying and adding context. The conflict between Israel and Hamas is playing out in the palm of our hands. Giving a wider perspective on what matters to them. People are worried. They are waiting for help and assistance to reach them. Live from Dakar in Senegal, this is Focus on Africa. Groundbreaking stories. But the traumas these children have gone through as a result of the earthquake will need to be treated. We have to do a campaign even with our bulletproof vest. Courageous journalism. Traffickers are operating in plain sight. Keeping the whole world connected. 24 hours a day. The scenes are absolutely breathtaking, but it's also what we can't convey. It's the dust and the stench. These aspiring cricketers are watching the first game of the Men's World Cup, cheering for both England and New Zealand with an equal amount of enthusiasm. We are the BBC World Service. I've always wanted to say this. It doesn't get any bolder, bigger, or better than the BBC in terms of the work that we do and the journalists. I thought you'd be clapping there even as we continue. And the man leading those operations is here with me right now, the Director General of the BBC, Tim Davey. Thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure. It's, honor, it's a real honor to see you all here and be here. And I'm very curious to hear, even as you look over this room, Director General, I'm sure it takes you back to your university days. Did you think the path would bring you here to lead the world's oldest, largest public broadcaster? No. In, in a word, I didn't have a clue where I was going. Um, and when I left, I, I, as you heard on the um, summary, I joined a commercial business in Procter & Gamble and did other things. And this is why I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of you. I'll tell you why. Because about 18 years or whatever into a, that kind of career, I, I, just, I did have a moment where we were, we were going through again another round of development on consumer goods. And I got home and I was living in Connecticut in America with a white picket fence and life was kind of okay. But I, I brought home some test samples of a drink and I thought, I don't care as much about it as I should do. And I thought, I, wanna, I, wanna, I honestly thought, I'd love to work in something I really care about that's really important. And I came back to the UK, and I had a young family, and with that, and I, and I actually got offered a commercial job, and then I got offered the BBC, and I joined the BBC, and ever since then, it's in my blood. It's every day I think I'm fighting for something genuinely important, 
And why I'm a little bit envious of you is, and I don't think it'll be easy, because life isn't, but I do think once you've got used to working something like you are or we are, that you care about, it's very difficult to not do that. And to do something that's important, which we'll talk about, it really is wonderful. So, you know, my job is a kind of weird job. It's got a lot of people to look after, a lot of services to look after, but at its heart is something very important that I care about. And that gets me out of bed every morning. I hope people in this room are picking little nuggets even as you continue to share some of the secrets of your journey. But one thing I imagine the young men and women in this room are thinking about right now is the disruption that's mm. coming to the media sector. They hear about AI, social media, media companies laying off, and people with big social media following are nowadays considered journalists. What does that mean for a trained journalist? Well, I think there's no doubt, and you guys will know all this, this is absolutely huge in terms of the amount of change and disruption. The, the media industry has largely been based to date if you look back a long way, and you know, we were talking even today about the fact the BBC has been nearly 100 years. I mean, we're, we're over 100 years old as an institution. And actually, when we started, by the way, we were just a radio business. And when television came along, people said, a bit like your question, they said, television, awful. It's, it's going to disrupt everything. It's you know, so we've been through some of these changes. But the thing that the internet does is... Traditional media businesses had power through limited distribution. So you've only got so many TV channels and I own slots. The internet essentially opens everything up. And suddenly when you go home tonight, you've got infinite choice, almost endless choice. And I think that puts massive pressure on everyone. But there is a, a good but, which is... I think at the heart of it, regardless of the distribution, regardless of all the noise, regardless of the competition, people in the end come back to what they trust and quality storytelling. You'll always have some fun on social media. You'll always do different things. But I actually think the value of quality journalism, stories you can trust, people you can trust, is going to rise up. I'm very, very optimistic about it, weirdly, because I think you might spend a lot of time doing other things, but at the end of the day, the, the desire to come back and know the facts and go to quality storytelling remains. And I would just have faith. Definitely. <laughs> But I'll definitely take any question, okay? That's great. That's what I like about this man. In fact, one of the questions I was going to ask, I'm going to throw it in here. You know they can tell the character of a man by his outfit. Mm. And I watched your interviews. I'm not sure I like the way this question is developing. <laughs> I watched a couple of interviews earlier, and I noticed two things. You're not a fan of ties. Neither are you a fan of black formal shoes, so to speak. What does that tell you about who you are, Tim Davy? <laughs> I've got no idea. <laughs> I, I, look, I, I actually do dress up now and again. I dress up for members of parliament, and when I'm in trouble... Um, <laughs> I think you have to be respectful, but the, the other thing is, I, I do want this industry, I do feel strongly that the industry should be open to all. And I do think you send signals. So, you know, we were talking earlier, the BBC at the moment is over 50% women now for the first time. That's I, where I expect a round of applause. I, I don't believe that how good you are is based on whether you come from rich parents or whether you come from a certain background or whether you talk posh. I do believe you have to be good. That's a different point, and it's, it's someone's demanding. I want people who are curious, good. But I don't want to look at people that lead the BBC and go, I could never see myself do that. And I'm not saying wearing white trainers is definitely the first signal. <laughs> But I do, I do think you can send out cues about that and about what kind of organisation you are. The other thing I noticed, all the people in Los Angeles who are billionaires were wearing white trainers. So I thought, <laughs> I may not be one of them, but I'm going to look like one of them for a while. 
I need to go and look for some white trainers. Give a round of applause to the DG. If you can, in 30 seconds, sir. I've never got a round of applause for my trainers <laughs> before. I'm quite impressed. Thank you. If you can, in 30 seconds. The BBC strategy for the future. How does that apply for audiences around the world? How does that apply for journalists around the world? Very simple. We, our strategy is to make sure time with us is extremely well spent. And we offer that value. We do it by offering you three things. So it's a simple thing. One is we go after the truth with no agenda. We're not led by politicians or we're not, we are working on your behalf to find the truth. Number two is we tell local stories. We're not just about mush, you know, global stories that we want to tell the stories of Kenya. We want to tell the stories of the regions. Of, we want to be absolutely grounded in the homegrown storytelling. And the last thing is we want to bring people together for civil, which you do a lot, um, civil dialogue. People talking to each other rather than shouting at each other on social media or frankly just dividing communities. We, we are very interested in talking to people and bringing them together for, in ways where they can listen, dare I say, rather than just shout at each other. And I worry slightly that the world is heading in the wrong direction on that. 70% of the world does not, no longer have a totally free press. I really worry about that. It's shocking, by the way. It's shocking. Um, and I believe in a free press. I think, you know, Kenya's got a rich tradition of this, but every country, including the UK, should be watchful of this, which is, are we allowing our reporters, you, to do your job without fear and not feeling you have to be in someone's pocket you need to go off the story. That's what we're about. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Looking for the brave souls here, ready to fire questions, not fire, ask <laughs> questions at the Director General of the BBC. Who's going to be first? I can see one hand here. All right, let's get the microphone. And on this end as well, I'm hoping to see more hands even as we continue. Please tell us your name, your university very briefly, and a brief question or comment. Okay. Um, my name is Cairo Karega, University of Nairobi. I just finished my degree in broadcast journalism mm. three weeks ago. Well done. Um, and I must say, this is a dream of mine to be in this place, my BBC bracelet. Um, my question is, how do you get into the BBC, especially fresh from campus? Or can you even get in when you're in campus? Um, we, we do have a limited number of opportunities for people joining the BBC. And by the way, we have 400 people in Africa. We are a big business you know, organization here. But I would just want to make one point, which is that will be for a handful of people. And I'm always very blunt, by the way, as you know, and quite honest. So the first thing you, you have to do is say, right, I'm going to go and get some experience, however that's going to be. And I tell you one thing, you very rarely in a career go, I want his job, I'm going to do three jobs and get his job. It's a winding road. And you can join the BBC at different levels. You can come in at different points. You might come in doing a job that's not quite what you had in mind. But the other thing I'd say is great people are very curious. They, 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 they want to learn. They don't actually define their careers too narrowly. I never said I want to be director general, apart from when I did the interview. That was helpful at that point. <laughs> but what I have thought is I'd love to do a job I care about that's got you know, leading big teams. So think about what you really like doing. Think about what you're passionate about and then go after a number of opportunities. With regards to BBC, it's pretty straightforward. We have a careers site, you can go on there, you can look at the various things there. We do have opportunities. We take a limited number of people, but it, you know, and we take the best of the best. But I would just be very open-minded. It's not easy, by the way. You haven't chosen the easiest path. And, and I think life should not be, you know, about the easiest path. You're going to have to, things that you really care about and that are really passionate tend to be difficult. By the way, my job is not, there are days in my job when I, I worry, what have I done here? Because it's so pressured or whatever. But every time I come back to, it's worth the fight. So apply to the BBC, put your best foot forward but also go and get whatever experience you can and keep knocking on our door because that's what good people do. 
I hope you got that right, young man. Let's see if we can get two questions now. I'm going to pick and one. And getting from... the first question in was a good start, by the way. So, yeah, it's good. <laughs> a round of applause, please, for that. Yeah. Karega, you said is your name? Okay, round of applause for him. I want to get a question on this end, on one on that end as well. Very quickly, let's get them in. Let's get them in. Do we have the microphones moving? You may proceed, sir. Hi. I, I probably would like uh, to ask a question when I'm studying. Iraqi is my name. I teach in this university. I've been a freelance journalist for the last 18 years. Mm. But I'm not saying that because you are here. <laughs> but, but I watch BBC every day. It's one of my trusted sources of information. Two questions. I say, very good start. I'm already liking the way this is going. Thank you. And you can see I'm in white shoes. Like oh, my God. <laughs> OK. That's two. Yeah. One of the things I've noted about BBC is that when I look at the thesis when I'm watching the news, yeah. you have had more diversity. Yes. I want you to comment about diversity in BBC. And number two, I've, I want to just comment briefly about how do we train journalists. The gentleman behind me has just said he has got a Bachelor of Journalism or something like that. And there's a school of thought that says you should not train people at a graduate level in journalism. What they should do is they go and study something, medicine, engineering, business. Then when they get the content, we train them how to be, how to be journalists. I think what I want to comment on those two. And finally, you said you lived in Connecticut. You said you lived in the uh, U.S. in Connecticut. Indeed, yeah. I live in a deep state. In a deep south. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I hope this is working. Can we get one more very quickly? I hope did you remember both. Or you I, I, I've, I've, I've almost forgotten both already. Go but ahead. If you're, you're in charge of remembering because okay. I'm getting old, okay? <laughs> okay, let's pick one more if we can, very briefly. Do we have anyone on this end? Yes. Okay, okay proceed. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Mweni. My I'm question good. is, um, oh sorry, I am a student at the University of Nairobi. My question is, how do we integrate technological advancement in media while upholding media integrity and ethics? Right. That's only like a Where should we start? question. What was the first one? Diversity? Diversity. Okay, let me rattle through these as quick as I can because we'll probably get a lot. We take it extremely seriously. And there's two levels to this. One is re making sure your organisation reflects who you serve. It's not complicated, which is if you're going to tell local stories, you need people who understand it deeply and not assuming that people from London, I'll be very blunt, you know, can do a better job. That is crazy. So we are really developing a diverse organisation and our preference is to grow people on the ground who have got deep expertise um, in terms of, I mentioned the fact that from a gender perspective, we're now mainly women. Across the organisation, we're setting the standard in terms of targets for ethnic diversity, for disability, and I track that every day. If you're a leader, I see the numbers, we really push at that. There is a kind of another level to this, which is that's all very well, but how included do you feel? Do you feel really part of the organisation? And we're spending a lot of time pushing the organisation out of London and just making sure that this is the centre of the BBC for the people who work here and for people who listen to the Swahili service, that, that is the BBC for them. There's no, you know, there's no hierarchy. It's all got to be fantastic and it's all got to be world class. Last point is diversity is also about diversity of thought and diversity of background. It's not just gender or ethnic group. It's basically also about what kind of background you come from, how open-minded you are. And I think you need a team. When you, when you, a lot of you will go on to successful careers. When you're developing a team, you need to make sure it's got different voices. I never recruit people that act exactly like me. But it's a very comfortable interview, but it's not the right person to hire. Yeah? So do not recruit people that are similar to you. It's absolutely profound in the way we do that. What was your second question? I've got Edu to education. Do you make a better journalist if you have an economics, a first degree or medicine or something of the sort? I, I, I don't generalise like that. I'm an English student and I happen to think that reading novels is helpful. I think, no, I really, honestly, I think the key defining characteristic of a journalist is they are incessantly curious, as I said. They look for a story. So 
if they're going into an engineering story, they will hoover up expertise, interest. They're just unceasingly curious. And I'm always suspicious of people who go, I'm a journalist and I just do this, or I'm an engineer, I just do this, or I'm in marketing. And it's, honestly, a lot of it is, some of it is special. There are real specialisms, like heart surgery. <laughs> I don't want anyone playing on that, or lighting. As, as, but generally in life... Or being a, a pilot. A, a great journalist is just, exactly, or a flying, you don't want to put me flying an aeroplane. Yeah. But I do think we, we sometimes exaggerate and we say to people, like, when I go home, people say to me, well, my children don't say, oh, look, the director general's arrived or the marketing man's arrived. It, I am dad. No, I'm being serious. You are more than a journalist. You are you. You are all of you. So I, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules on that. I think the key is the individual and their ability to learn, be curious and not arrogant about it, and really, really be humble about you know, soaking up knowledge. And I think a great reporter can go across a brief and go from science to religion to you know, health if they're hungry to learn. I think the third question, which was yeah, thesis-like. Yeah, go no, ahead. This is, in some ways, I think it's, it's, a, it's a question that often get asked, but I, I, I don't think, if I may, it's that complicated. Which is, let's, it doesn't matter whether you're doing a short X, you know, kind of little bit of short form or a clip or a post, even a post of, you know, however many characters are allowed nowadays. Um, or a half an hour program. We never compromise. It's as simple. You never compromise your editorial standards. You, you, you absolutely, at the BBC, you, it is rigorous. And it's built over years, which is you find out the facts. You double check, you, do, you double source stories. You go after things. And you really do the work. Then you decide, and we have had to change to do this, then you decide that you're not just going to do the radio reports that you did, but you are going to do an online report. You are going to put it on television because not everyone's going to watch an, you know, Africa Eye investigation over an hour on television. They might watch the news report or they might watch you covering it. Um, so I think you need to be very flexible about the means by which you deliver your story. But even in an environment like social media, you need to stick to your guns and stick to your principles. And in the BBC, that is non-negotiable, just so you're clear. We're, we're really, really rock solid on it because it's what we stand for. So we don't go, oh, that's, that's social media or that's online so we can loosen our standards. That's disaster. Has AI complicated this conversation? That's a, it's, a, it's a really good phrasing of the question, if I may, because, <laughs> because it, I think it's exactly the right word because people go, oh, is AI a threat? Is it? It's complicating. It's, it's a complicating factor. And the reason is it's fairly straightforward. It's a big threat, but it does give us real opportunity. So the threat is disinformation. I mean, if you want to watch a video of me speaking in Swahili, saying all the things I don't believe in, that can be generated pretty quickly and flawlessly. The challenges, therefore, are very real to organizations that put themselves you know in where we do in terms of integrity having said that there's a couple of things we have full control of our platform so that's going to become more valuable when you're making your program we have control we're not in the hands of anyone else we're not in the hands of someone making up stuff then you get to how do you deploy ai and we are currently doing a number of pilots with the really big companies i won't name them all but they're really big ones and what we're trying to do is, how do you use AI for good? If I wanted to, if you had a great piece of journalism, why can't I translate it into 42 languages immediately so everyone can see it? If you've done a good podcast, why can't I have the written version of that? Why can't I have the subtitles of that so that someone who's got impairments in their hearing can actually hear it? Yeah, sorry, read it. That is absolutely the opportunities of that. So there's a, I won't bore you, but there's 101 ways in which AI 
we can keep our principles but still use it. And I think that is exciting, really exciting. What I don't think we should be, say, is with a dusty old bit of journalism, and I do traditional journalism and I don't engage in AI. That doesn't work. But the other good news is we won't be replacing presenters in the short term. <laughs> yeah. I thought that Ron Cliff, you should be clapping. We, we are safe for some time. Thank you so much. And Ron Cliff will be my timekeeper. You There's only a few people clap that, to I, be fair. I don't know. Slightly <laughs> worrying. Yeah. Good. I'm looking for inclusivity. And then the BBC guys. Anyway, moving I know. on. I'm looking for inclusivity and diversity. Any questions from the back? Lots of questions at the front. No? Okay. There's a hand up there. And I'm looking for more women voices. So there's another hand there. Yeah. Let's go start with the introduction very briefly. My name is uh, Wainena Gishere. I am uh, an econ student at the University of Nairobi. Great. I, I was asking if, what are we doing to empower young people at the BBC? What but are the strategies we are using to empower young people? It's, it's a great question. And I think that we, we've, got a, we've got a couple of answers, but what I would say is it's work in progress because the world is changing so fast. So, I'm not going to give you one of those corporate answers where I've got all, everything settled. I think we've got real work to do to make sure the voice of, you know, young Kenya, and there's a lot, you know, a, this is a very young population. That's correct. And we have also traditional media organisations with traditional power. And tra so, what do we, I'll answer your question. Firstly, I think we have to give, the one thing we can do is give voice to people. So we have services that get to 112 million people. So the, with the team, we want to make sure you empower people by giving them a voice. So the first thing is not just when we're having a debate show or whether you've got guests, what young people are we bringing on? What voices are we getting? Are we hearing from the street people who are you know, young with different views? And often they don't quite fit some of the current power structures in politics or organisations. So I think we need to push harder to give people a voice. We have a platform. Um, then we can talk about bringing us, our own staff making sure we're bringing younger people through the organisation, hiring people, making sure we're listening to them in the organisation. And finally, I think technology can allow us to begin to interact with people and get feedback and talk to people. You know, you can get more live response. And I think we just have to be listening. I think the time has come for, you know, where traditional broadcasters, I will tell you how it is, I will talk down to you, as it were, is over, finished. We are here to serve. We tell the story, we do it well, we do it with authority and integrity, but then we listen and we respond. So I, th I think that's how we empower young people to. And, and by the way, I'd be careful, some people say, well, young people are not interested in this, they're only interested in the light stuff. I don't see that. I see people, it depends on the issue. That's correct. Susta you know, what, what the future of, what's the future of Kenya in terms of sustainability? What's the, what's, you know, diversity and inclusion? What kind of society are we building? What's the future in my locality? People are very, always very interested. These aren't age-related issues. They're just interesting topics. And the other thing is how you tell a story, how you do the headline, how you write about it, is very important to keep the door open to a lot of people coming into it, as opposed to solely telling it, for instance, through political parties. Because you might say, oh, I'm not interested in politics, or I'm not interested in that. So I, I just think there's something for us all to think about in terms of when you tell a story, how do you keep the widest possible door open to it while getting interested, people interested based on issues and what they care about? And that, I think, is something where the grammar of journalism is changing a little bit. Active and, and social listening, just to, you know, off the back of that, is something we do a lot at Focus on Africa and Adira TV as well. Yeah. And, and it's and something we do daily, actually, just to ensure that we're not just telling people what we think they should know, but what they want to tell us um, as we do the programs every day. All right, I'm seeing more hands going up, DG. We're in trouble here, but we're going to keep going for a little bit more. Uh, we'll we'll do the quick fire. I'm going to give quick answers to everything, which is not my normal... This man was made for this platform. Let's go for it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, we're going for quick fire. Hello. Um, Hi. My name is Pleasant Kendi from Tangaza University College. Um, my question, I like the fact that he went before me. It was also quite similar. He spoke about empowering young people. Mm. My mm. question was also similar on mentoring young people 
as BBC, and I am really standing among great minds, great people, and several other courses. Law, for example, they have a lot of platforms for them to grow, to learn. But journalism, in particular, we do not have quite a number. And as you've said, it's not that we are not interested because we could not have been yeah. here if yeah. we're not interested. So we're really interested, we're willing to grow, and we understand the importance of mentorship. And when we go for attachments or internships, we might not get exactly the mentorship that we desire. So what could you do as BBC, which you've mentioned some of the things, um, to help us, to mentor us, to work with us, yeah. so that we can cross over to your cool. side. I think it's an outstanding challenge, by the way, and I think it's a really good push. And I think we've got work to do a little bit. I think a couple of things on the internships, by the way, I think they are useful. The apprenticeships, the internships, do, they do provide a role. And we're looking at, within Nairobi, actually, what we could do in the, in the field of internship. Because I think people getting experience is important. I think, frankly, um, engagement like this and making sure you our partnership with the universities we're talking to you we have that expertise available i don't quite know exactly how that manifests itself but all i would say is and i don't know the detail of how we would do that if i'm honest but i think your challenge is extremely well put and i think we as the bbc should play a role in supporting you so that let me take that away as well but internships yes mentoring and also doing sessions like this where hopefully it's not about me but we can have a discussion, we can talk, and we can learn together is absolutely something we should be doing. Just to understand a bit of the impact of the BBC in Africa, I don't know if Fiona or Ehi want to also add to this, if we can get a mic, just one of them, just to talk a bit more about some of the programs that the BBC... I see your hands, I'll be coming to you, don't worry. Uh, let's get one voice in, uh, then I'll also say one thing before we continue. Oh, <laughs> I didn't expect to get the mic. Uh, so my name is Juliet. I'm actually based here in Nairobi, and we are keen to offer and to work with uh, institutions such as the University of Nairobi to support the next generation of, of journalists. So I'll give you my card and we can talk. Uh, but also, as uh, Tim said, we're going to be rolling out an internship scheme in the next couple of months, and we will definitely yeah. be speaking to this institution to see how we can make that happen. I just want Fiona to speak about other opportunities across Africa. The internship is the big one, right? <laughs> that, we, we, we've heard this before, and, 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 and we are working on, on, on how we do that. Um, and I think what, if we, if we take Africa Eye, which has been mentioned several times, the way Africa Eye works is with freelance journalists, with investigative journalists at different stages of their career, because they bring to us a brilliant story, a brilliant story of access that only that person can get or the thread of the story that if we pull it and we use all of our forensics and all the way that we now have to tell stories, the kind of tools and techniques that we use to get to the, the truth, that pursuit of the truth, um, then we work with people who aren't BBC staff but are working either for themselves as freelancers or uh, we have a lot of work with our uh, partners. So obviously we have a lot of partners across Africa who take BBC content and we build relationships with them. So many of you, I think, will go on to, to work in those environments. And you will still come across the BBC, and hopefully we can still have that really positive relationship uh, with people coming through in different ways. Um, but together, we can, we can do that. And so I think there's so many different routes. Thank you for that. OK, we have a few more minutes left. So uh, one hand here, and then we'll pick one there as well. Thank you so much. My name is Faisal Ilbagir. I'm a journalist, a human rights defender, and I'm back to school at University of Nairobi School of Journalism. I have two questions. Uh, BBC and the cuts. We have seen a lot of cuts uh, for the BBC, which means, I mean, that the BBC is really suffering from financial cuts. To what extent do you think that these cuts are affecting reporting Africa? This question number one. Number two. We believe that uh, BBC have gained the trust of the people mm. from more than 100 years. BBC and reporting conflicts, sensitive conflicts issues, yeah. wars. We have seen the BBC in Ukraine. 
We have seen the BBC reporting Gaza. Unfortunately, uh, people, many people, they think that there, there is a big war now in Africa. It's one year old. The war which has happened in Sudan on the 15th of April 2023 up to today. People, they think that the BBC is under-reporting Sudan. Can we find why? Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Um, two twi quick answers. Um, we are under some financial pressure. So we've had to make some changes. And by the way, those changes are not just about cuts across the BBC. They're also about making sure we've got the right digital resources. So you're moving money around and making tough choices. And part of my job is actually to, you know, if you ever get to leadership positions, sometimes it's not about popularity, it's about making those choices. And there have been some really tough choices um, in terms of as we've closed things, started things. Um, I would like to see more money, by the way, going to, into the international BBC services, the World Service, and I've spoken even in the last two weeks that we need to keep investing. I would say our commitment to Africa is rock solid. 400 people in Africa, we absolutely are committed to the storytelling in Africa that we need great journalists and we need the depth of coverage. Now that links to your second point, which is I think they, our record in reporting these conflicts, and thank you for your comments, is second to none. We do it bravely. I would say as someone living in London or outside London, it was actually good to see Sudan and the terrible conflict you're talking about leading our news, not three stories down, it was the lead news. So I'd say, slightly defensively, we are reporting. As you know, and you will know, the restrictions and the dangers of reporting are very significant. I would just say we are totally committed to making sure that conflicts of this scale are not forgotten. And part of what the BBC can do, and I take your challenge, is just go at the stories and report it and not just go to those stories that maybe get more attention. And I think that is part of our role and I accept your challenge. Loving the diversity of questions here. Let's keep them coming. Okay, let's get from this side. We have, oh, oh he's okay, up. he's already up. Uh, All right, go just ign ignore the, ign that's a good journalism. Ignore the person calling me. Okay. That's how you should do a political press conference while they just right, stand um, up and ask the question. Great, anyway, right. we're all yours. My name is Adrian Lubanga. I am a student at the university. Uh, my question to you is uh, from a, story, a storytelling standpoint and a focus on Africa, what are some of the improvement areas for the BBC? I think, I think overall, I mean, this man might want to answer that, but, and thank you, Adrian. I, I think the first thing I'd say is, I think obviously you do a very good job. You'd expect me to say that. I think the team is doing exceptional work. And if you look at folks on Africa and Africa Eye, I am very proud of the work. Having said that, anyone who knows me knows I like your question. Because I, I like never saying you're perfect or it's all fine. And I don't like it when corporate people do that. We've got loads of work to do. I think there's often, you know, sometimes the day-to-day, the -day, what I call treadmill of news is such that sometimes I'd like to spend a bit more time pausing and getting a broader context. You understand what I'm saying? Like, what's really happening here? Let's step back. I'd like to tell more stories of Africa that aren't just issue-based, yeah? Um, but these are all things that are kind of improvements, not crisis. They're things that this man would be thinking about, Juliet, who spoke on the office. We're talking about it all the time. What issues are we missing? How can we make sure we're reflecting the diversity of Africa? What's happening in some of the conflicts you were talking about earlier? Just, so I'm constantly healthily dissatisfied. And I think as a journalist, by the way, you should feel that as well. You should... Never say, I've done the job, I'm finished. And I think in Africa, we could tell more, and this is, by the way, a general thing across news, is you can spend all your time as a journalist just chasing the issues, reading social media, responding to everything, reading your emails. You know, in a, you, know you can't, I can hardly walk 500 meters now without looking at my phone. It's really bad. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes think we need just to step back, and this does relate to covering some of the big stories, and just calmly set them in a broader context. And I think we're doing that, uh, and we're doing it well, but we could do more of it. Okay, let's see if we can get... Um, she's already up. Go ahead. Um, hello. 
My name is Laura Happiness from Masai Mara University. Mm. Um, do you get your sources, or sometimes do you source your news and information from citizen journalists? And if so, what is their future at BBC News? And my second question is, how applicable are the theories used in mass media? Um, for me, we've been taught some of the theories such as the agenda setting, the gatekeeping theories, the social responsibility theories. How applicable are they when you're relaying news to your viewers? Thank you. I think she was paying attention in class. Yeah, I, I think uh, um, on the citizen journalists, I think there's no formal relationship there, I don't think, in terms of how we work. But the, tr the truth is we're interested in sources. We're journalists. So we're interested in talking to people wherever the story comes from. Now, if someone brings us a story, we're a publisher. So we have standards. So we're not just a vessel to publish any work from anywhere. But I think there is definitely something now that the news organisations like ourselves feel very, I'd say almost excited by, but it's difficult, which is we can get on-the-ground reporting now through social... Everyone's carrying... You know, we're all carrying a first-class studio here. Not first-class, but you know what I mean? This thing can film some decent footage. And citizen journalists are important in terms of eyewitness testimony. Now, the thing I would say is we're not, again, to repeat, we shouldn't just put that out. And you know this. We should be checking, working with people, because you're vulnerable to some of the things we talked about. So I still think we need to control it in, to, in, in our way. But I think absolutely engaging with citizen journalists and working with them is actually the way we should be behaving. But at our, I mean, it, but it's our standards. Um, I'm not very good on all the various theories, by the way. And I think I would say it's really important you learn about those things and you understand the factors. So you can, what the blind spots where you can lead an agenda for, as a journalist from a big organisation or a debate can get too narrow because that's what journalists are interested in. I think we should be healthily paranoid about that. So I would be conscious of those theories and you know, be understanding the impact of your work. But I'll say one thing at the BBC is more than anything, we, we do not spend a lot of time talking about those, just to be clear. It's not that they're not important, and you definitely need to do your classwork. But what we spend our time talking about is the, the quality of our editorial guidelines and our delivery against them. And that is our North Star. That's, as you say, that is our, that's what we, we head towards. And what those editorial guidelines try to do is mitigate against the risks some of the risks we've talked about. So that's how we operate. Very interesting way to see it. DG, if you have room, we'll take one last question. Of course. I think, okay, there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Clive Ayuko. I run a blog called The Whistling African. Now, in 2023, in 2023, the highest book club in Japan went to Miss Rai Kudan. I'm thinking the book, the, the prize is called the Akutagawa Prize. Now, Tim, I don't know if you're writing a book, but this is basically a perception question. I don't know if you're writing a book and if you're employing AI to actually write your book, but the introduction of this particular book, actually, the AI actually figured out the introduction. So I don't know if you're writing a book and are you using AI? And perhaps, what is the, what is the... Treat you, ...teach you more about humanity than, in my view, some of the other books that we're told to read. So, so I, I would love to write a good novel. Um, I think it's going to be a long, long time before AI gets close to some of the novelists I love. The imagination, the humanity, the randomness of it. And look, there are people who say in 40 years AI will be so intelligent, it will be able to do a good painting or this. But guys, let's not worry about it for a minute. Let's worry about things that are a little close to home. So the truth is I will not be using AI for writing a book ever. I did try it for an after dinner speech once and the jokes weren't good enough yet. <laughs> so I may be using now and again, but, and I think AI driven search as a tool is going to be useful for us. It's going to be better, but just keep
keep your humanity. We, have, we, we publish principles, by the way, on AI, and part of that is to keep human creativity and human oversight over everything we do. And at the end of the day, the one thing I would say is when you're writing, when you're thinking, never underestimate your audience. They're smart. They understand. I can sense when there's good work, when a human being that is, is there. And we don't, want to, we, want, we don't want to give that up. We don't want to give that up. And um, we should be working very hard, as I said, to use AI for good, for things that help us and not make it into a bad thing solely, but manage as humanity actively to use it on our terms. And if I write a book, it will be overlooking the sea in a very remote part of England with a book and a pen, and I'll write it myself. You know, DJ, we always say final question. And final, final question. Okay, right. there's okay. Ron Cliff. Okay, there you go. There you go. Fine. Ron I'm already Cliff, here. We, Oh, okay. <laughs> I give up. Go ahead. Briefly, please. Okay. My name is Marcio Mundi. I'm a student at the university and also work with UNCTV. I'm going to ask a specific question mm. on traditional media in the digital age. So what is the BBC as traditional media doing to combat propaganda that has increasingly or escalated with the advent of social media and led to widespread apathy, especially amongst Gen Z against traditional media. And the last one is, um, when it comes to AI, you've talked about journalists not being replaced by AI, but do you think in the long term, is this actually true? Are there some roles in journalism that might be replaced with AI? And in this case, what would the BBC do to ensure that the human interest is actually kept at heart? Thank you. Well, there, there might be, you know, longer term, there might be more administrative tasks that AI will be able to do. The, what we'll do to mitigate that is make sure we've got journalists who've lived in communities, who understand things, that are human beings with all their experience, not a, you know, a AI model. And look, I, I may sound old fashioned, but when I walk through a street in Nairobi, I'm feeling, I'm smelling things, I'm understanding things that is going to be very difficult to replicate technically for a long, long, long time. And first-hand testimony, i.e. you going to where a story happens, understanding it and telling it, AI is going to be a long way behind that for a long time. Searching the legal cases on an, on an issue you're researching and finding anything that might be relevant may save you time through AI. Great, let's use it. Last, last answer. Um, I think we're trying very hard not to see ourselves as a traditional... Me we are a old and very, you know, kind of... We built on our traditions as an organisation. But if you are... If your journalism... I've said a bit of this already, but if your journalism is limited by being on TV or on radio, you're you're in the wrong place. You're just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, a huge... We're the biggest online news service in terms of trust and reach. Yeah, we're, we're, we're huge because we built an online business. Now we're building digital apps. We're, we're in the UK and globally. We are investing extremely hard in making sure we deliver it in your terms. When it comes to the trust issue, we put a premium on bringing people to our services in the end. So we'll, we'll want to bring people to our services where we can say, you can trust us here. And I think also we need to, just final point, is because there's so much noise, because you can't trust almost anyone, we will become more precious, but we're going to have to tell people how we make stuff. I know it sounds a bit weird, but this is how we got this report together. This is how we verify. You know, we've got a brand called BBC Verified. This is the truth. This is what we've looked at. I think we've got to show a bit more of how the BBC does things. You would be shocked if you went into our office and impressed by the quality of the work. So I want to show more people what that actually looks like. And I, I, I think as journalists, you're going to have to say, look, I'm trying to do this and this is what I do, because otherwise people may guess what you're trying to do in the wrong way. So set the standard and never give it up. It, honestly, it's a great opportunity. So much noise, so much nonsense. 
Stand for something that counts. I mean, surely that's going to be more precious rather than less precious in a new age. Tim, I'm going to allow you at this moment to catch your breath for a bit. I know you've been really trying to answer all these questions. I see more people streaming in. We're going to have to stop it here or we'll keep it here for another hour and a half. One of the things that was brought up was about mentoring of journalists. Mm. And about nine years ago, the BBC started a fellowship, an award, the BBC Komla Dumor Award. A fantastic program because it doesn't just celebrate African journalists. It gives them a chance to be promoted, to grow in the field. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be the 2018 you were. winner. And I think this is where you clap for me as well. And, and the first male winner as well. And I'll talk a bit about my experience, but first, let's watch that clip of the journey of the last award. Great. and the award, um, I think um, that kind of recognition and people saying, okay, we're supporting you, we think you're the best out there, it turbocharges people's career. It gives, you, it gives you something to really go after and say, look, this is what I do. I've been recognized by people and there's an incredible panel that, that chooses this, so this is not a random award. You can't just turn up and get it. You have to be doing the work. So, I'm a big fan of these types of awards. We do a number across the BBC. We do different awards in different places and recognise people. Often, actually, uh, in memory of some of our finest journalists, I can think of other things we do around the world in that, in that, in that sphere. And I think it's simple. Recognising people and championing people who do the work you do has two things. One, it, one, it has a great you know, impact on yourself. But also, it's very clear for you guys, if you looked at the stories of the past winners, you'd go, hmm, these people, I understand what makes great journalism work. <laughs> these are the people. So yeah, look, it, has a, it has an absolutely huge effect, actually, I think, in terms of our operation and how we, how we think about our journalism, which is there is a standard and some people are really at the top of their game. I mean, you threw a challenge back to me as I wait for that signal from the technical team. In 2018, I got the chance to work for about four months at the uh, National Broadcasting House in London. I think for me, what I gained out of the experience was, one, great confidence. Not just that you're a local or a national player, but that you can play at a global level. The skills to back up that confidence. The ability to sit with people that you'd admired watching from afar. And now, you know, I remember when I met, you know, Lise Doucette and many others. And yep. the kind of confidence it gives you to sit on a platform like that. And I encourage young people here, apply even if you don't think you qualify. I know previous winners who applied many times with regrets, but they never gave up. The last one I think applied maybe two or three times, DG. And right. so that's what I encourage young people here today. Yeah, and that, you've touched on a very profound area actually, which is confidence. And I think it's really interesting that, because what you don't want to have is arrogance or misplaced confidence, like you're almost, the world owes me a favour, yeah? I demand a job, yeah? But you also want to have co build confidence in your work and what you do, and that requires you to listen hard, to meet great people. Also, I spent a lot of my career watching good people or copying. Copying, I'm like, in, in, we, we say in, in the UK, like a magpie, which is a bird that takes things from other people's nests, yeah? And let, I'm telling you quietly, because we're only on film here in front of a few people, but 
part of my career has actually been, I'm going to copy that. That's really, look, at the pers- look at the way that journalist went after that story. Who are you copying now? Um, you can tell me later. I th- actually, you know what? I often, it's not about very senior people or often, you know, I've just been visiting a community radio station. You just literally, you say, okay, look at the way this person is bringing the community in or looking at issues. I'm thinking all the time, how do I learn from people? And I think the awards are a chance for you to just say, okay, I'm learning from that person. I, I can learn. And that humility plus confidence is a really interesting balance. And I think you guys, you've got to get that right because there's going to be some tough times where you say, I just can't get, when am I going to get through here? And having the confidence to go, I can tell a story, but not be arrogant about it and not get angry about it, but literally just do the work and play the long game. You know, it's not about the next month. I've always played most of the jobs I've sat in for quite a long time. You grow. Just take your time. Take your time. I think we're going to have to leave it there. You know, DG, one of the most confident people at the BBC is Ron Clifford. It. He's also a bit arrogant. Right. And he's going to take us to the next part of the program. Ron Cliff, you may come back on stage. A round of okay. applause for him. And an even bigger round of applause for the Director General of the BBC, Tim Davey. What amazing insights that he shared. Come on, guys. I think you can do a better job than that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so, so much. Ron Cliff, what do you want us to do next? Uh, so I just want a photo. And I want to invite uh, Juliet Jerry. Um, Fiona, you can come. I wasn't going to invite you, but you can come. Uh, B- B- Brenda, you can come. Eh, hey, please. Um, and the representative of the university, please. Kuja, uh, <laughs> too. Uh, so I just want first a uh, photo of you with all these nice banners, first facing, and then we'll do one where we'll have each one of you guys stand up, and then we will have, yes, that is the one. Yeah, so let's ha- first have one, one of uh, them with, uh, with all these banners. I think that's important for, yes. So here, 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 yes, here, thank you. Um. Now, I, I, want, I want all of us, wherever we are, just stand. Just stand wherever you are, and then we, we will be here, and then, uh, you know, we can have all of them at the background. So let's all stand, and uh, let's have one big photo, one nice photo. I'm taking my photo. Yeah, sure, you should. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there. Uh, I think we go down here, kindly. Yeah, let's go down, let's go down, let's go down. Good. So here, yes. You can fill the spaces on the stairs. You can come closer. You don't have to be where you are. Come closer. Come closer. Let's fill all these spaces here. Tafadali. Yeah, let's come. Let's come closer here and uh, fill these spaces so that we have one nice photo here.
Let's give one big round of applause to our DG. And the guests, so uh, the DG has to leave because he has a number of other engagements, but the rest of us will still be here. We'll have so many questions from you. We will still take questions and answer them. So um, we'll just allow them to leave for now. And then we will have all the questions and, 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 um, and the BBC staff around here will all answer all the questions that are still there burning. So the microphones, kindly, the roving microphones, can we have them? And then we'll take a number of questions still. Wahiga, you'll join me on stage. Uh, are there any roving microphones around here? Good, good. Wagi, yeah, we, we have roving microphones. So do we have a third mic? Ooh, I don't know where it's. Uh, okay, so. Do we have anyone moving around with microphones in case yes, there yes, any we have a microphone okay, here? Good. So, like I said, to uh, Tachukoma Swali Tena, I'm Ron Clifford Dit, I work, I do Dira Dunia TV, Wahiga Moura, Focus on Africa TV. Tell them when they can watch our programs. Good. So, uh, so you can watch Focus on Africa TV uh, on K24 TV, locally, K24 TV, every evening, Monday to Friday, 8.30 p.m. That's Wahiga. correct. Right. And on BBC World at 7.30, Monday to Friday, also. That's we can get Focus on Africa TV. Go Definitely. Ahead. You can watch Dira Dunia TV Monday to Friday, 9 p.m. on Star TV Tanzania. Uh, so if you are free to air decoder, you can actually watch Star TV on free to air. It broadcasts locally. So Star TV Tanzania, 9 p.m. on BBC YouTube and Facebook, 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. You can 10 p.m. You can watch uh, on uh, K24 TV. That's Dira Dunia TV. We have about 20 minutes. Any questions that you feel we can also help you answer, please fire them away right now. Between you, there's a, a few years of experience in the media. <laughs> and we'll do our best to answer some of your questions. Okay, yeah, so let's get any the mic question, Any question, just raise up your hand. Uh, so we can start with this lady here, beautiful lady here. You can go first. Any question about the BBC, we'll be happy to answer. Any question. Um, hello everyone. So my name is Rhoda and I believe most of the people here are young people in the media in the media career. Either they are transitioning to the job market or still in campus trying to discover themselves. So you are experienced journalists. What would you tell you in our age right now? Yeah. What an answer. Um, I, I've been in media now for the last going on six, almost 16 years. I've spoken to lots of journalists, journalists based in Kenya and journalists based outside to hear their life journey. This is the first thing I can say. No one's life journey is like yours. So, of course, you learn from everyone. And the DG said he, he looks at things he likes in other people and he does them. But different people got their media break in different ways. And you need to find what works for you. You might find a guy like Ron Cliff did not wait until he finished university. He started hustling while in university, applying for jobs, a door opened, he never looked back. Others will decide to go their own way. They'll decide to build their own social media presence. I've seen people who are blogging in the universities, who are running active sites, so that employers come looking for you, okay? I've seen another group that say, everything happens on platforms like LinkedIn, where people go and stalk HR managers, they go and sell stories, they go and build their LinkedIn, and you know, with that, they're able to grow. Others say, I'm not gonna be just a journalist who reports news and that sort of thing. I'm going to go and do data journalism. I'm gonna go and study, AI. if there's an AI certificate, I'm gonna go and do it. Why? When I go for an interview, I'm able to offer not just my ability to report, but also this extra skill. You have to figure out what will work for you and keep trying. It might take a combination of three, four things, different attempts. I think he kept saying, knocking, knocking, knocking. I was nominated for the award that I won, I think twice or thrice before I finally got it. If you're not ready to keep knocking, you might give up too early. So you need to find out what will work for you. So I can't tell you now, go and do this or go and do that. But this is what different people did. What do you think will work for you? Go and give it a shot. Ron Cliff. Yeah, uh, I think it's the same thing. So maybe in 2005, there was Kenya's first referendum. I'm not old, but if I say 25, <laughs> what is wrong? So I was first year. I was doing my diploma, my first diploma, in Mombasa Polytechnic, 205. I walked to this radio station, a small community radio station. In 205, I was like, So I'm here to offer free services on the um, day of referendum. 
And that was my breakthrough. The current Mombasa governor was the MD of that station, so I did uh, a, free, a free service. They told me they will offer me a uh, thousand bob back then. So I, I was there for two days reporting. When I came back, we were like 10 students. So when going back, everybody was paid. I wasn't paid. I was told the boss wants to see you. I thought I'd done a mistake. Nikingi Adani, the boss was like, we want to keep you. We will start with attachment or internship for three months. And then that is how I got my first, my first job. So Nikimbelembele, Sazengine, you know, it's good. I've seen a number of you here, you know, dashing to, to talk to, uh, to, to the DG, not just to take a selfie but to give your card, you know, to, to get contacts, get contacts, you know. Try uh, talk to, to the other staff about Akuapa. So at, at times, you just push yourself and then a door will open. I think it's also discovering what other roles are there in media beyond being on camera. You can see people moving around here for the BBC doing different roles. Find out, be curious. You never know which role will open the door for you to get into that space where you can then navigate. You can ask Roncliffe how many different things he's done on the journey to where he wanted to get to. I think we believe that I'll only take the opportunity that is the one that I want now. Life doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you might even spend seven years doing something different, but you can see that, you know, if I take this route, it might take me to where I want to go. Very true. If you look at, uh, so where is Maggie? So Maggie is a floor manager. She's the one uh, directing everything here today. She does the same job at the BBC, but you also do a podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm a podcast producer for a podcast called Dear Daughter. It's about writing in letters to dot potential daughters or daughters you might have who are either your nieces or your friends' children, and I'd want you to listen to the podcast because it has very many insights on how a girl should be raised or the kind of regrets that a parent has when they were raising their children. Yeah. You don't have to tell us all the jobs you've done, but tell exactly. us some of the roles that you've, you've done, done to get here. You. <laughs> Hustle out there. <laughs> you. I'll start, um, I joined the university in 2011. I was in the University of Nairobi School of Law in Parklands. But that's not what I wanted to do in life. So I told my dad, I don't think I want to do this. So he told me, go back to the university and check on what you want to do. So I came in, went to SOJ, registered and started. In second year, a friend of mine who used to work at Citizen told me there are internships that are happening. I should just go and try luck. So I went to Royal Media, worked for about two weeks. I think my, uh, a character that I don't like about me is I work too much. Like I will overexert myself because that's what I want to do. And I'm passionate about something when I'm passionate about something. So after two weeks, I was given a job. And I started out as a... <laughs> Production assistant on set. I used to do Inspector Mwala, Papa Shirandula. And then I went up and became a production as, uh, um, assistant producer for Slim Possible season four, five, and six. And I did uh, assistant producing for Sakata season four and five as well. And that's how I got to where I am now. We were the first people to do Viusasa, and we used to do productions in, I think, six languages. So imagine producing for six different languages and you can only speak to, yeah. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. So Piggy and Maggie thank Makofi, you, thank you, thank you, Tafadali, Maggie. even as she shares. So, and that's the story for most of us here. And so, again, I can't answer your question in a straightforward way. You need to figure out what path works for you. But it's always good to go out there with the main, to start thinking of those many options right here, right now. Because it's not straightforward out there. Life is ups and downs. And, and that sort of Very thing. Very true. Any other question? Yes. Okay, my name is John Clinton from this university. And my... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and my question is, how does media maintain the journalistic integrity and objective in the era of fake news? Wahiga, you'll take that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things, I can't speak on behalf of, of the media, neither can I speak on behalf of many things, but what I can say is what I've experienced where I am right now at the BBC, one, we are constantly in training 
okay? And what training does is that it keeps reminding us of the fundamentals of journalism in totality, but also the BBC editorial values on truthfulness, on accuracy, on impartiality, and the, and the tenets that are the foundation of the BBC. And uh, I think with experience comes a second sense to always check all the news that we receive, where it's sourced from. And there are certain standards around. I mean, we don't even have time to get into how many sources should you have for a certain story before you can announce it. And also, um, how can, can you protect those that you're reporting on? Even if someone is accused of something, how sure are you that it's them and not the person next to them and that sort of thing? And so what I can say is that it's important to have and to work in a space where you have veterans who can guide you. Please lean on your lecturers. Lean on those that have gone ahead of you while you're in school to learn from them as much as you can and keep reading. Don't make mistakes that others have made. Learn from their mistakes so sure. that you don't have to make them. The challenge with fake news is that it could cost you. Um, Kenya, the world has become very litigious. You don't want to be the one purveying fake news. You can be sued as a company. You can be sued in your personal capacity. So, so learn as much as you can about how to safeguard the journalism that you are doing so that you don't break the fundamentals of media and get yourself in trouble. True, and uh, the BBC, we have something, I think, BBC Verify. So it's a tool, and there's a big team that works, and they are funded very well to just do verification of news. So anytime I have um, a story, you see a tweet, something, we just throw it to them. In Nairobi, we have a big team that works for BBC Verify, to pick out fakes. So most of the time, um, you know, people will share on social media and stuff. So before a BBC journalist retweets something, you first throw it to them so that they can verify for you. If you're not able to do it yourself, if you can't, then yes, we have the tools, we have the training and resources to do that, but then we have a very good platform that we can just throw everything to them. Any other question? Yes, please. Go ahead. I'm Crispin Ogalo from uh, Kenya Methodist University. So my question is, uh, what's the difference between a news agency and uh, the difference between a news agency and uh, BBC? Uh, because we do have got Reuters, which is from the England. We also have AFP from um, France. There's one news agency from China and uh, Associated Press from the United States. So what's the difference? So media is, you know when you think of media many times you think of you know, these guys who work to bring you news on TV or radio or so forth. Because of the challenge however of, of raising revenue, media houses have come up with different wings that do different things. So for example a media house can decide to have one wing being a news agency which is where they collect news on behalf of paying subscribers, put them on a public platform and those who pay are able to access them. But that could be just one arm. This, all, this same broadcaster could have a website. This same broadcaster could have a TV station as well. So I think you're going to see a lot more media houses moving forward that play five, six roles. A media house could have a financial services wing, where if you want to know about stocks in New York or other places, you get them in that one platform. A media house could have a professional fact-checking arm. That's all they do, full-time. BBC Verify, for example, is an example of that. So I think nowadays, you'll rarely find one media house doing one thing. That media house that you know as, an agent, as news agency alone, that's not the only thing they do. Uh, we've all been, f uh, in a sense, compelled to have different arms because one, you know, audiences demand it, but second of all, it's, it's the way in which media is moving. And so what you knew as an agency doing one thing has changed nowadays. Good, and uh, the other explanation also is uh, most agencies sell their news. So the BBC is a public broadcaster. It's fully funded by British taxpayers. So we don't sell. But, but AFP, for instance, they, have, they will collect information and then sell to different media houses. Even to the BBC, we have a contract with them. So, the, so whatever they have, whatever info, whatever news, whatever stories they have, theirs are for, for, for sale. So we can also sell. We can also buy from them. So that is the other difference. Sawa? Yes. We are seeing so much here. Can we get some, some action here? Let's have the lady go first because she has a microphone. And she has and stood already. Go. <laughs> Just a minute. Let's have her first. 
Hello. Yes. Uh, my name is Maria. I'm a third year journalism student here at the University of Nairobi. Uh, my question is, what is your take on the narrative that international stroke Western media propagate a lot of stories that paint Africa in a dark way, like a conflict hidden zone, dry, arid areas? And what are you as journalists based here in Africa doing to change that narrative? That's a very good question. Since we can remember that, do we take yeah. one more? You may kumbuka. Okay, let's see. Uh, good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, my name is Ipor Alal. I work for the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. Some of you know me. Maybe Waihiga, you know me. <laughs> nice to see you. Karibu sana. Thank you. I'm also an alumnus of this um, university, University of Nairobi. Um, I, was not, I was not supposed to stand up to talk, actually, but I've been moved by the question the young lady has uh, asked. So mine is not like a question, it's more of like motivation. I know I don't work for BBC, but journalism is the same. The principle is the same. Um, I joined KBC as a volunteer, like Rodcliffe says, when I was only 19 and I was not paid anything. I just volunteered, and I thought I would work in the newsroom. Unfortunately, I did not. And again, why Higo has just said, sometimes what you want to do is not what you, you do. You know, you don't do that thing that you really want to do. You'll do other things before you land on what you really want to do. So the young lady, what I would tell you, and any other person who is here, that um, integrity is very important when you're when you're doing your work, journalism is very diverse, and you'll you, you know you'll meet so many things, so many people who will try to persuade you to do things in another way. So be very vigil when it comes to integrity. That integrity is very important because I know you, Gen Z. I don't even know what my generation is called, but I know that I have Gen Zs in my house, and I I can resonate what she says with what they tell me in the house that there are so many ways that you Gen Z's cut corners to get to where you want to go. You might not last long after you've cut those corners. So what I'd just like to say is that um, journalism is very important and please do not just stick to journalism. Like some years back, I was on screen and on radio reading news. Then now I am no longer doing that because I did not just learn how to read news. I'm also doing other things in the background. So when Rodcliffe joined us, the year that he joined KBC, that's the year that I decided to mentor other journalists in the background. So I think if anything I've said is something that you can take home, please do. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, maybe we respond before that question yeah, sure. gets low. Rodcliffe, I think we're on Zappo. Good. So... <laughs> um, she talks about? Let me help you with that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot. Coverage of the African continent, I think, was your question, correct? Let me say one thing. If you want fair coverage of any issue uh, on any platform, you need more people uh, within that platform who understand the issue for you to properly cover it, right? So, for example, if you're covering Kenyan news and your journalists are only from certain areas, of course you won't get fair coverage of entire Kenya. And so one of the things that we say, and I think it's one of the things that I'm proud of of our team, we cover Africa based in Africa. And so what you should see progressively is more accurate coverage of the continent as you have, you know, the BBC being one of the few international outlets that actually has the studios that do the Africa shows on the continent. A lot of others will do it from Washington or you know, other parts of the world, but uniquely that's one of the ways in which BBC stands out. And what that does is it gives people like Ron Cliff and I a chance to uh, counter, push back, suggest, give ideas on more fairer and more balanced coverage of issues on the continent because we've lived here longer than we've lived anywhere else. And so I can say that it's a step in the right direction when you look at the BBC. But of course, we can't speak on behalf of the wider international media arena. But I think social media has also become an equalizer. It's very interesting when you see a, you know, a picture of something 
and Kenyans on Twitter go crazy. And they will, you know, uh, really put comments, and you'll see the comment section under there. And the publisher is forced to with retract that photo and put a more fairer one. So I think we need to work together. Those who are in the international media outlets who are from Africa or from whatever place needs more fairer coverage, you know, raise their voice. But even for those of you on social media, social media is a powerful platform. Keep speaking out. It, it does make a difference. Very true, very true. Any other question? Uh, so we will take one and then come to the ladies here, please. I just kindly wanted to ask about the international correspondence aspect. And Wahiga, you've worked on both sides, on both Citizen and currently at BBC. So we as upcoming students, you know, one of the things that we are observing, like, for instance, I'm studying at USIU Africa and I'm a sports journalist. But one of the things that we can't go beyond I is I feel the like I'm listening to a broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you can make a very good radio presenter. Thank very you so much. Good. I'll do my best on that. What's and your question or comment, sir? Uh, one of the hitches is when it comes to sports journalism, we're actually being hindered when it comes to coverage, the financial aspect of it. And yet I, as a student, I want to be an international correspondent. I am looking at my icon once I go out from that studio, maybe from class. I want to get to that extent, but I feel like, yes, even if I leave this institution, I'm from class, I've done a project, and yes, I have been assigned a duty by one of my local media agency, but I know, yes, even if I get into that house, I will experience the same hitches that, I'm, that actually I'm facing right here in school. So what are some of the things that we need to do from a local aspect so that we as students get quite intrigued when it comes to the international aspect? How can you get to such heights of international correspondence? Thank you. Umesikia hiyo? Umelewa? Eh kidogo. Amesema ni university gani? Oh, USIU. Eh hao ni America. Sisi wa Dedan Kimathi University tuko tu sawa. Any I think there are many ways to answer your question and and that's the the, the challenge and the beauty of where we are in that you could get to where you hope to through different routes. And now what I say is Wherever you will work, there will always be challenges. So don't think there is heaven in front be because of challenges that you face right now. Every space has challenges. You had the DG talking about budget cuts. So even that place where you think when you get to, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, that's not true. A every space, whether it's a, 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 sta a radio station in a college or a radio station for a national broadcaster or an international broadcaster are working within certain confines. It's you to figure out how to work within the system wherever you are, but then how to do one better. And so it's figuring out how can I make sure that for this time that I have at this college radio station or university radio station, I, I am the best that I can be there. I add the most value. I usually try and be memorable, that people remember you. When you leave this forum today, you know, you might remember the jokes that, you know, Ron Cliff gave. That's, that's important because next time you meet Ron you remember this guy? He was very interesting when I met him. It's always important to leave a mark wherever you go. But secondly, while you are where you are right now, always be thinking, what's next? And if a door opens to the next level where you get to work for a, a national broadcaster, how do I stand out there? Because those who are there have years of experience. Those who are there have made a name for themselves. I remember when I was younger and I wanted to get into media, I used to look at other journalists and say, I think I'm better than them. Just give me a chance with that microphone and I'll show them what I can do. Until I got in. And I realized some of them work longer hours than I could. Some of them have trained really hard. Some of them have done certain things. And you to be saying to yourself, there's a lot of talented people in this field. What's going to make me stand out? And that will naturally progress you to where you want to go even internationally. The story of Komla Dumo, who started in Ghana in a radio station, and then one day got a chance to work for the BBC and rose even above covering Africa stories to covering you know, stories from all over the world and still staying true to coverage of good African stories as well. Go and read about him and read about others. Study their journeys. You might pick up a, a tip or two that will help you on your journey as well. Sure. Can we have the microphone here for this lady, please? Then we'll come back to you. We just have to be balanced. Kindly allow us to pick. We have six minutes. Yes. So kindly allow us to Let's pick see how who, we can do that. who gets the mic so here, and then we will come back to you, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Cynthia Soy. I'm a final year student in the University of Nairobi. And uh, my question is uh, to Waihiga. Uh, you mentioned that the way social media influencers are becoming uh, journalists. 
So I am a journalist and I want to use my social media platform to show my journalistic skills. So I want you to help me to know how to use my social media as a journalist, not to put out as a social media influencer, but as a journalist. And my friend also has. <laughs> yeah, um, hi. <laughs> my name is... My name is Beverly Ngoka. I'm a student at the University of Nairobi, and I also practice at the school's TV and radio station. And my question is almost similar to what Cynthia is asking. When it comes to branding, because in Kenya right now, it's become sort of a sad reality that when it comes to picking people to hire for radio stations, they're going to go with people who have the highest social media following. So what can we do as upcoming journalists and as journalism students to sort of brand ourselves so that even though we can't really have the same amount of followers, you can level the playing field in terms of the strength of your social media? Okay, thank you. So I'll start with, with you as first before Wahiga comes. Um, so two things. One, it's not true that you are hired by your number of social media. That is not true. So get that out of your mind. I know people think, you know, you have to be very big in social media. That is just an added advantage. But as a journalist, because there are journalists who don't have social media presence. For instance, if you do very hard-hitting investigative, like the people who do Africa Eye, they are not on social media. The real people who go on the ground to research and do the production, I will tell you for a fact, they are not on social media. Because they can't do that. It's dangerous for them, for their families, you know, for their friends and all that. So at times, that is just a fallacy. It's not the truth. But again, yes, we are in the age of social media and you can leverage on social media to even get a job and to influence yourself in certain positions. So how do you go about that? One is... What kind of person do you want to be known on social media? So when it comes to branding, it's very individualistic. You know, I am not Wahiga, Wahiga is not me. Whatever I post on my social media, uh, Wahiga can't post whatever I post on my pages. We're just totally different. Yet we hold the same position in BBC. So the, the thing is, you have to be very keen on yourself. Who do you want to be? How do you want to be identified? For instance, I, in my social media, uh, I am not the same person on, on Instagram, Facebook, to X. You know, the, I know so many people uh, these days have, uh, you know, you post one, one tweet and you want that photo to go across all your platforms. I don't do that because my Instagram uh, family is not like my ex family. In the X, I want to be, I interact with CEOs, you know, I want to be more professional, very serious and all that. Then I can have my stupid jokes on, on X and on TikTok. On and, TikTok. You know, follow on, his TikTok. Exactly. <laughs> on, on my TikTok, I do some crazy stuff. If you follow me, Ron Clifford, it on, on TikTok, that is for my TikTok Why family. Why on TikTok? Exactly. For plugging. Yeah, definitely. So, so, so that is the thing. That is when it comes to branding. It's how you want to brand yourself. But yes, you can take advantage of your huge social media following to even, you know, I mean, Cyprian Nyakundi, for instance, he makes money off his social media pages. Cyprian Nyakundi is actually a media house. I always tell him, he's my friend. So I'm like, bro, bro wait, wait. when you media house on your own. There is a guy uh, from Tanzania, um, Milad Ayo. So Milad Ayo is a radio presenter with Clouds FM. But Milad Ayo is more big on Instagram than any other media house in Tanzania. I think the only people who challenge him are the BBC Swahili on Instagram. The guy makes his money, not on his formal employment as a radio presenter, on his individual page, Milad Ayo, not Clouds FM, his own pages. He has, right now he has 16 journalists working for his Instagram page. 16 freelancers working for him, his Instagram page. So that is how you can, you know, create a brand and earn from it and become big on social media. Again, what do you want to do? Like Milad, I also saw an opportunity. So many of Tanzanian uh, media houses, you know, they were not taking real advantage of the huge numbers on social media. So he went ahead and started posting. News. Him is actually posting news stories, hard news stories, sports news stories on his Instagram page. He doesn't post his personal life. Never will you see him posting his own personal life like some of us do. 
He's just posting stories. And if you go and look at Milad Ayo, he has millions of followers. He is big. He has so many adverts on his personal page, even more than what clouds get on their social media pages. So it's doable. I mean, I think one of the simplest things you can do now, even if you feel you don't have many followers, make sure that your accounts are in your name. That's the first step, okay? So especially if you're looking to use and to get into journalism in a, you know, in a more professional format, if you put certain names where people can't even identify that's you or not, that's going to be a challenge. So that's the first thing, even your pictures, even your content. We are told that HR managers around the world are now checking people's pages. When you're going for internship, when you're going for you know, a job uh, advert, and they check, and they can even ask you in your interview, you posted this, a political view, and, and that sort of thing. And of course, it's your social media account. You have all the right to post that. But the world does take note of what you're posting. So be careful about that. What I find interesting is when people identify a niche, something that you're passionate about. And even if you're not employed anywhere at the moment, you're just in university, you make your social media platform the place to go for that kind of information. I've seen a group of young people who have made business advice their forte. I think they go and some of them just go and research. They pick interesting tips, whether it's business, fashion, you name it, and you're constantly feeding us with that information. And then you go and visualize it on TikTok. You know? What you put on X or Facebook, you then kind of put it in a different format on TikTok, and you don't know which platform will pick for you. Social media is becoming as important, in my view, as your CV. A strong CV with the necessary qualifications, ETC, backed with good social media following, or at least you know, a social media that shows that this person is a thinker, is creative, is thinking out of the box. I mean, he's talked about bloggers who aren't looking for jobs because you know, they've created their own media houses as well, and we are aware of that. So take your social media very seriously. See what other guys are doing. I mean, I'm amazed. Recently, I followed some um, journalists who are based in Ghana. I mean, some of them have three million followers. Three mil I, 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 I saw three million followers, I followed them. Because I want to know, what are three million people looking for in your account? And I realize not just one, not just two. So build your platforms and start building them. And step one, please go and register your name across all. To, even if you don't use TikTok, just go and get your name there, register. Uh, in LinkedIn, at least have it in your name before someone else takes it. And then figure out how you're going to build it. It's so important in the world that we live in. I think we take the final one, Ron Cliff. Yeah, yeah. Final, so, final, because uh, we are out of time. The guy there, and then Hi. we will take a final, final. So let's, ah. let's him go first. Hi, I'm Boyd Bryan from Mount Kenya University. I have a personal question to both of you. What did BBC consider that made you stand out from the rest? And what are the top most qualities that BBC consider for one to be part of them? <laughs> so uh, uh, let me go first. Uh, and, uh, Answer for us. I'll, okay, I'll share a story. <laughs> I'll share my personal story. I have applied, I applied for a BBC job 28 times before I got the job. 28 times. Yeah, I know. And the 26th time, so in 2016, 2017, when the BBC was looking for uh, this big expansion, they had an event here at the University of Nairobi. And I came. Very mad. I was going to you know, harass all those editors because I had, by that time I had applied, applied 26 times. I had never, never, ever gotten any positive response. So when I came here, they had a forum where they were training people on how to do your CV for the BBC. How you do your CV and how you apply for a job for the BBC. And to me, that was a game changer. Because immediately after that, I applied for my 27th time and I got invited for the interview. Although I didn't get the job because I didn't have... What, what's one tip in your CV that, that changed? So the one thing that changed... Did you have a six-page CV, seven-page? Yes, page? I, had, I had a big... Uh, my CV... Paka Nasari Shiba. Nasari School. Exactly. Uli Ulikuwa meka hapo. Kila kitu. Paka Banga Serani Prime Marine Mombasa, where I schooled. <laughs> so my CV was, was very big. You know, Ulikuwa Meshiba Kabisa. So one key thing that I picked is when you are doing your CV for a BBC job, the first thing they are looking for are your skills. So your skill set, other than kusema, 
You know, I'm a graduate at uh, University of Nairobi. Your skill set. What are the things that you can do? Can you edit video? What are the, 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 um, the different apps you know, that you can use to edit video? Can you edit audio? Can you do photography? Can you do videography? Can you do uh, you know, audio, audio recording? All those skills that you have that are very unique to you, but that you know that you know, they separate you from your colleague or from your friend. So that is the first thing that I learned. I was like, okay. So I've been doing my CV wrong all those years. All the 26 times that I had applied for a BBC job. Because when I studied journalism in 2004, when I joined Mombasa Polytechnic to do my first diploma in journalism, my dad laughed at me. He said, I mean, we come from a poor family. We don't know anyone. And I told him, because we listen to the BBC every evening, I will one day work for the BBC. So I wasn't really doing it for myself, but to prove him wrong. And so <laughs> for 28 times, then, uh, yeah, then I got the job uh, in 2018. So that is key, uh, learning how to do your CV, starting with uh, the skills that you have. Because, yes, most of us look at, um, you know, your qualifications from an academic perspective. So you have a master's, you have a degree, you have a diploma, certificate, and all that. I'm not saying it's not important, but what I'm saying is the BBC will first look at your skills. Two, you have to show proof of having used those skills. So every time you are applying for a BBC job, be very specific. You know, I have, so like we like sayings as journalists, you know, I have covered Kenyan election. But do you, so, do you say I have covered Kenyan the 2022 presidential election as a field reporter in Turkana? That alone sets you apart from anybody else who says, I've covered Kenya election three times. So be very specific. Give specific examples. So one question that the BBC will ask is, in any interview or in any application, is how are your skill set going to help you in this particular role? So again, go back to that very role. Look at what specific things are they looking for. Are they looking for a field reporter? Are they looking for somebody who is good in translation, for example? So in my case, you know, so if you have ever translated, so I had worked with, um, with the team that translated the 2010 constitution, but I had never put that in my CV. And that was a game changer when I said I was part of the team that translated the 2010 constitution from English to Swahili. So that particular aspect changes the whole perspective. So again, just, yeah, be keen on, um, on your skill set. On your experience, work experience, what you've ever done before, you know, you might look at it as something small, like, uh, you know, I was a, a floor manager for this event, like Maggie. And you might look at it as something, ah, you know, it's not worth uh, being on your CV. But that is a particular aspect, a particular thing that you actually accomplished. So if you put that in your CV, that changes you know, at times there's a tie. You know, I tell people this all the time, and Waige, you know this. We go for interviews, uh, so you're marked out of 24, and then there's a tie. That's right. So they're looking for a 0.5. So they go back to your CV. And just look for something unique, something special, something that is only you that have done out of the rest. And boom, that gives you an edge. Na pia ni kujiamini maze. Hii dunia ni kujiamini bana. You know, I can't, I can't be like Wahiga. No, I see better people than Wahiga here, Pole, bro. But yeah, there are better people than Wahiga in this room. Yeah, there are better people than Wahiga. There are better people than me. You just need to position yourself as that better person. I wish you had asked that question when we had some of uh, the other members of BBC here. They would have answered somewhere in the panel when we were being interviewed. But I've, I've gotten the chance to, having worked in the media for the time that I have, I've observed what makes great journalists, and they stand out everywhere. You know, in a national broadcaster, in an international broadcaster, there's nothing special about us in that sense, but there are certain core things. I think one, a great journalist is, has this belief, uh, and you know, you have to find a way to get that belief that as much as you may not have the skills or the experience of others, that given the chance, you can do it. When you hear Ron Cliff telling, I think it's your dad one day, that I'll be on TV for the BBC, that was, a, pro, that was a, a confidence. I don't know where he got it from. I remember a job I used to do before I ever got into media. And one day we were wrapping up at the office and the TV was on and people were reading news. And I remember telling my colleague, one day I'm going to be there reading news. 
And he laughed and said, where from? You're in a completely different field altogether. The people who go there are special. They are made in a certain way. They come from a certain place. There's a perception that that's what it is. That has changed, you know. Um, and so that confidence, that courage, and I told him, watch. And the day I made a debut on TV, he called me and he said, I can't believe it. So it's that courage. It's that tenacity. I think also people who are great in journalism study a lot of what other great journalists have done. This guy has his role models. He's not even ha happy with where he is right now. There's somewhere where he's aiming to go. You had the DG who's at the top, you know, he's the, he's the boss of the boss. And he says there's people he's studying to get better. You're constantly studying. You're constantly learning. Sometimes you watch a movie, not just for entertainment, but for inspiration. What did this person do on their journey that I can learn as well? A great journalist is always learning also. You know, the number of times in our field, one day you're a doctor, you're having to pick up on medicinal terms as you follow a strike somewhere or something else. You're studying the, a war in a different part of the world and you have to learn the, you know, the players around it. Recently, I was, in, I was in Senegal covering the election there. You have to quickly pick up on everything that's happening. Speak to people on the ground. They tell you what's happening. You have two days to do all of that and then be able to accurately inform your audience about it. You have to be a quick learner. This thing of saying, I need time. Sometimes this... Career doesn't allow you time. Now, go. You need to tell us what's happening with this. You have to have that quick thinking ability. Um, and finally, you know, that's that courage. That courage. Even if, you know, they think you're too young, even if they think it's this, you know what you believe in your heart. Uh, I, I have seen young journalists step into media houses as interns and retain jobs because there was just something special about them. I've seen young journalists go for interviews. I remember um, the most recent experience for me was during the 2022 presidential debate. I won't name names, but there are a couple of journalists there that came to, to, to conduct those debates, and, and I think for them that was their moment. They handled those debates so well. I think some changed jobs immediately. Others you know, became nationally popular, and, and you know, people got to know them after that. Um, it's that courage that they may not know me, they may not know my name, but when I get a chance, I'm going to prove myself. I exactly. think those make great One journalists stand out. One opportunity just one opportunity. Don't let it go. Because that might be... Yeah, I attack you mention name, but we all know that guy who was in K24. And then he went for the presidential debate. Ayub Abdi Kadir. And then he asked some tough questions and everybody was like, eh, umse anafakua citizen. And the next week, the guy made the move. So, keep your opportunity. I'll pick random person and tell you, can you do a vote of thanks? That is your opportunity to shine. That is your opportunity. You just never know. You just never know who is. You just never know because this thing is being broadcast. You don't know who is watching. That might be your moment. You know, that might be. So, ukipata opportunity. I always say, um, so this is a secret. So, Mimi, I want to go to Al Jazeera. Okay? The day they tell me kuna internship opportunity, I will resign. Because if I go there as an intern, they will not let me leave. You need to have that confidence. That if I go there, I will do my magic, and they will not let me leave. So to finalize your question, last year in June, in April, when we were going for the interviews, uh, there were so many people. It was only one position in Swahili. I had done five years radio. I had left KBC in 2018 where I did my four years stand at TV. And so we had all these local people doing TV at that moment. They had all applied. And I remember I kept telling uh, Maggie here that Nita enda kwa your interview and I'll be the best. Nita <laughs> Rosha. <laughs> Why? Because then you have to take your time to study even your competitors, what they do, what are your strengths, and then take that moment. Any opportunity thrown to you, even if you're working for a, a small community radio, do it like it's your last day of job. Because you just never know who is listening. Yo, Asante. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and any other broadcaster represented here, take that job very, seriously. very seriously. Please do that. Don't okay. have to go up, Isasa. Time's uh, now. We only have two more questions. questions. So we can only two, take two. In your very final, briefly. final. Final, final. So you go and then the lady. Please, Musipeane microphone tena. So the guy there, and uh, there is a lady there already on a microphone, and then we will uh, we will think about you. 
So very briefly, 30 seconds, Tafadhali. One Greetings. question, please. Greetings, my name is Ian Biagon. My question is, I'm a sports analyst and a sports journalist as well. My question is, uh, BBC is really doing well in Europe, especially in terms of sports. So I was asking, back here in Kenya, what is BBC Sport doing here in Kenya since tuko na wase wakali, tuko na wase wanoma, bro. So I really want to know, like, what are you guys uh, at BBC Sports doing exactly? Thank you. Thanks. I think uh, BBC takes sports very seriously. Uh, we had a big team uh, that went to uh, Cote d'Ivoire for the Africa Cup. Uh, Cup of Nations Championships, and uh, we will then still this year have a team of over 50 going to the Olympics. That is, that is what we do. We take sports very seriously, but unlike our local media, where we have, I know most people ask this, I don't see a sports segment for, 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 <laughs> for Focus and even for Dira TV. We scrapped it off because we want to treat sports as news other than giving it a segment. And then at times when you give sports a segment, you have, at times you don't really have very powerful stories, but simply because there is a segment to be filled. You know, somebody comes there with some shoddy reporting, but it's a segment, you have five minutes, so when a sports reporter who have five minutes to fill in that bulletin, you have to fill it, even when you don't really have a, a sports segment. The same with business. At times you watch... Um, uh, and here I will challenge, uh, I know my, my sister is there, my senior one at KBC. But yeah, at times you watch KBC and then you watch the business segment and you're like, D must we really have it as a segment on its own? Must we really have it? That is the question you ask yourself. Because it's not really a very powerful business story, but it's there because you have space to fill. So we try to avoid that at the BBC at the moment, but we take sports very seriously. And yes, if you have ideas, bring them on then we will see what to do. The lady there... Very briefly, next question. Oh. Uh, hi, Hello. my name is Vivian from Daystar University and I'm an aspiring political journalist. And my question is specifically to you, Mohiga, but you can also answer. Um, what is the future? <laughs> Others. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm asking him specifically because he was a political journalist. He still at is. Radio, at Royal Media, sorry. So my question is, what is the future of political and investigative journalism, especially in Africa, where we've not really embraced democracy 100%? Uh, the sensitive matters like corruption and poor leadership that are yet, like we report them, yes, but we don't really tell stories. I'll give an example, like, I won't mention the name, but I think everyone knows him. The guy that used to do big investigative stories very bold, but then after a while, I don't know if he actually went into politics, kupenda, or he was given an envelope, but he used to do good stuff. And I'll give another example, Cyprian Nyakundi. Like, he's doing really great, but he's a blogger. He's not a political journalist. So in Kenya, I've not really seen a political journalist with that muscle, like the, the confidence, the tenacity to report such stories, because we feel like as Africans we have, we are yet to be 100% democratic. So I, I might be wanting to tell a story on corruption, yes, but I fear for my life, or I want to investigate a scandal, but I'm not sure how the leaders on top will take it. So for you as, a, as an investigative and a political journalist, how would you inspire some of us who want to go to those sensitive fields, but we are very scared because we don't know the outcome of it here? Wow, very good question. So I, I, I think what I can say is that I think it's, and I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this, is it possible to be both a political journalist and an investigative journalist? I think so. Um, although an investigative journalist you know, will eventually make a lot of enemies in the work that you do. So you probably won't have good sources anymore. They might fear you, they may not like you. So let me split the, the, them into two. For political journalists, I think great political journalism is one where you are able to get information that the public needs, the truth, from your sources without becoming, quote unquote, corrupted by your sources. I think what Kenya and Africa desires is for political journalists who can be truthful 
but also get exclusive information. Now, getting exclusive information means cultivating sources. And sometimes there's a danger that these sources might take you to one side. When you hear people saying, Oh, journalist niwa ile opande. Oh, Roncliffe niki muangalia, anakali pigia kura ile opande. For example, that's a problem. And so I think there's a gap, uh, and the challenge is for you who want to be a political journalist, is how can you appear as impartial as possible in your reporting? That when you stand and report about this political party, we trust you. And when tomorrow you go to this other political party, we trust you as well. And even the politicians themselves will trust you because they know you don't take sides. And they'll respect you. And hopefully they'll be able to give you information that your audience requires for you to do your job. Investigative journalism, I think Kenya has come a long way. Right now we are, we are looking at some of the great work that John Alanamu and African Censored have done in regards to uh, the concerns about uh, fertilizer scandal. And John Alanam was actually called to the Senate, I believe, to talk about his findings. And later on, you know, we've seen the government even saying that, you know, there are challenges with, with, with fertilizer, you know, in a sense, confirming the work that John and his team have done. And I've seen what they do. They do fantastic stuff. And there are many others as well. Here at the BBC, we have an Africa Eye team that's done fantastic investigative work, and it's constantly churning out content, not just from Kenya, but from around the continent as well. Investigative journalism isn't easy. If you're looking for an easy job, don't get into it. Chances are your life could be threatened, you could be followed. Um, sometimes it feels like it's not worth it because you'll do a great story, the public could cheer for you today, and then you know, forget about you tomorrow, even boo you if you ever make a mistake as well. I'm sure if you've ever sat with uh, other investigative journalists, they'll tell you that sometimes it's a thankless job, but it's such an important one. Because I feel that as much as you know, we have a lot of democracy across Africa, there are still gaps where only media can shine a light and only an investigative journalist will be bold enough to tell stories that other journalists will shy away from. If you can do political investigative journalism, even better. We need more of that. But there's a courage, there's a tenacity, and I think learn from the ones who've gone before uh, so that you don't make any of the mistakes that they have made. True, and also investigative journalism requires a lot of funding. So again, that is why some of our media houses really cannot go deeper into investigative journalism because it needs funding time and at times you don't really have that because a, a bit, one BBC in um, like uh, Africa Eye story, they will do between six months to one year, one 15 minutes episode. Six months to one year. They're out in the field, they are filming and stuff and at times you have to also build rapport and confidence with the people you're working with so that you can get you know, some of those employees in to get cameras, it was not easy. It's not an easy job. So, yeah, a lot of funding, but that is the way to go. I think um, no, this one here, on this is the last, 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 last. Okay. Kindly stand, last, Major, last. Wad, we, uh, wade chai. Yes, Akuna yes, I chai. know. I know. Kuna chai fifth floor. Kuna chai fifth floor. Oh, wade. Refreshments. Oh, wade unakula sayi tu. Uh, our engineer, oh, wade. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the last question. This is the we last, to, last. We have to wrap up. Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity. I use BBC to learn French myself and um, read stories as well. And as this Kenyan girl that is also doing a foreign language, I haven't had that representation of you can present in a foreign language for a media house. So what is the future or is it even important as a student to diversify yourself and maybe hope for working for BBC in France or in Senegal or those French speaking countries? Because if I apply for someone who's a native speaker, they'll have the upper hand. And is that a problem or is, it, is that something I should be worried about as someone who'd like to even write? I'm more interested in the writing aspect um, in a foreign language, for example. How many languages do you speak and or write? I, I, I'm learning two, Chinese and French. My I goodness. I speak English, Swahili, my local language. Ebutumpigie well. Makofi, oh my goodness. You, you have already opened up a world of opportunity with that ability. I told you I was recently in Dakar, in Senegal, to cover the election. My limited knowledge of French was tested to the extreme. And I wished I'd paid better attention in the few French classes that I did. Don't give up. That opportunity to speak all those languages could open doors for you far above anything you can dream of. So if you have a love of languages and the ability to learn them, especially, I mean, which French, I mean, you, you're on the right track. 
Exactly, because uh, there are so many opportunities in our Dakar Bureau in Senegal, and uh, every time the all of West Africa, they will ask for language, and some of us can't get such opportunities because mimi na ongea tu Kiswahili. Mzee, na English yangu ni kidogo, ni very limited. Sinigoli magi? Ni half half. Eh half half. Unajua, sisi watu wa Mombasa mzee. Half half photo pony university. Half 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 half. So yeah, so if 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 you have that, that is an added advantage. Kindly put it on your CV. Okay? Where you start, where you have your skills and then indicate there that you are multilingual. That gives you an edge over me in some of the opportunities that might come. Unaweza hivyo tu ndio upate job mzee mimi nikose. Naona watu wametoka ndio tuombe wasimame tafadhali na mwenye anapeana voto fans ulisema ni nani. Wasmame, I want to give a special uh, thanks to Owade. Owade please. Where is Owade? Actually Owade has a clip he wants us to watch. Owade tunaweza icheza kwa sasa? Let's play that clip. Still feel, still feel as though Cobla is here with us. I still feel as though Cobla is here with us. I still feel his presence, his beaming voice. Uh, he had this incredible ability to make anyone he met feel special. He would walk into the newsroom and you would, you would know he's there before you even set your eyes on him. We had this massive bear hug that he gave to people and then that throaty laughter of his. See, the BBC's always had a problem looking cool. That's where I come in. <laughs> he was professional, he was fun, he was engaged and he was just such a joy to work with. He had a lot of authority. He owned that studio, that studio was his, and he was able to connect with that camera with uh, the kind of ease that I've, I've seen very few presenters do. Welcome to the world's newsroom. He believed that the African story should be told in its entirety. So, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Since the mines closed down, how many of you have been able to find work? Just raise your hands. There are such wonderful stories to tell. Today we're not just talking about a continent that's rising, it's a continent that's there now. The Komla Dumo Award is going to provide a great opportunity. I mean, I wish I had something like that when I started out. We're looking for somebody who is incredibly creative, incredibly smart, somebody who is engaging, somebody who understands how Africa fits in with the world. It's great to see that this award has been set up, allowing journalists to follow in the footsteps of Komla. I cannot wait to um, see all the big ideas that people have because we've asked people to share ideas for a big story they'd like to do. I'd love to be in that position to be able to have the BBC help me craft that story. It's about telling the human stories, taking a big issue and making it human so that people across the world can connect to it. And I know that that was something that was very important to Pobla. What impact will it have on the ordinary people? We're going to tell you that story and bring you much more covering the continent as we always do. Somebody has got to win this award. You know, why can't it be you?